There are two villains in this piece. The first one is human, Dr. Charles Smith. The second one, though, is the system. I mean, there's more than, if you know, in that first category of Charles Smith, there's more than just Charles Smith. It took a lot of people um, to make these uh, miscarriages of justice happen. Um, Charles Smith is kind of the through line. No one played as large a role as he did in all of these different cases, but in each individual case, there was a lot of players involved in making it happen. But, but yeah, the reason why it lasted as long as it did was because he, he worked in the system. He worked for people who, who believed in him, you know, in the end wrongly believed in him. And, and when the signs started to show that perhaps they should be concerned about uh, the work that he was doing, they, you know, actively protected him, you know, and uh, it took a long time. There was, there was early signs. I mean, there was a case, uh, there was a criminal case that was settled in 1991, a full 10 years before, you know, it finally came to light, before they finally decided that they were going to uh, take a deeper look into, uh, into some of the work that Charles Smith was doing. And a lot of tragedy could have been avoided if they had paid attention and no one was paying attention. I figured he was the head of this special pediatric pathology group. Pediatric forensic pathology, yeah. It sounded very impressive. I thought, wow, he must have incredible background in both pediatrics and pathology. And then I find out, not so much. No, he had no training. I mean, no specialized training or certification in forensic pathology. Um, at the time, you couldn't get training or certification in forensic pathology in Canada. So that's something that, that was a problem that was, that was recognized and has since been, been rectified. Uh, but at the, you know, there, there was lots of forensic pathologists in Canada. They just couldn't get certified in Canada. They had to go to the States or the UK. And, and Charles Smith never took that step. And even on, on the pediatric side, you know, child working with children, pathology and children, uh, he didn't get certified until 1999. I mean, he started doing autopsies he started his career in 1980, so it was very, very late in the game before he even got certified on that side of it. And you put the two of them together, and really, he ran this Ontario Pediatric Forensic Pathology Unit at the Hospital for Sick Children in, in Toronto, and he was the guy. I mean, he was the, the most important person in Ontario when it came to child deaths and trying to figure out why children were dying. Uh, when, when there was suspicious circumstances, and really one of the top voices, one of the top people in the country. Tell me about the connection between uh, the Susan Nellis sick children's um, story, trial, and Think Dirty. Susan Nellis uh, was the nurse that worked at, uh, at the Hospital for Sick Children in the early 80s, and there was a number of children that, uh, that died under uh, it seemed like, I mean, it's a hospital for sick children, so sick children are going to die, uh, sadly. But after uh, some time, they felt that some of these deaths were uh, suspicious, and they came to believe that someone was, uh, was poisoning the children on the, on the ward, and, and Susan uh, was eventually charged. Uh, it, 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 you know, the case against her fell apart, but people were very concerned that there was a serial killer operating in the hospital. And um, they had a they had a judicial inquiry afterwards, and the uh, the the commissioner of the inquiry, you know, he he really went out. Uh, uh, um, I, th I mean, I think in in doing the research that I did, he you know, I, he he kind of went beyond what his mandate was. And the con one of the conclusions uh, for that was that they were that there was children that were murdered. It just you know there wasn't enough evidence to build against Susan Ellis, but someone was killing these kids, and. Um, this is right when Charles Smith was starting. You know, I, I can't say that he was directly involved in any of this, but he had a front row seat. I think Dirty was a memo, like literally that was the name of the memo. I think it was Memorandum 631, if I remember correctly. But the message from it was, um, we need uh, people involved in death investigations to be hyper vigilant and hyper aggressive in their investigations. Literally think dirty, assume the worst until proven otherwise. And Nellis, I think, was an influence, likely an influence early on in Smith's uh, career. Around the 90s, there was other cases that were missed or were nearly missed. The most high profile one of those would be Tammy Hamolka, Carla Hamolka's younger sister, who was originally, it was ruled a natural death. She had accidentally vomited, um, and it wasn't until much later, after Carla and her husband, Paul Bernardo, were arrested for later murders, that they went back and looked at that case and realized that actually she had been drugged and, uh, and sexually assaulted by, the, uh, by Carla and Paul. And, and the feeling within the corner system was that if they had have 
got that right the first time that they wouldn't have been free to to do these later crimes and so that I think that in some other cases similarly close calls uh, where things were almost missed really motivated the the chief coroner at the time to pressure and, and, and press upon people involved in death investigations to really, really go for it. Of course, the danger, and that, that sentiment makes sense. You want people to be hypervigilant. We don't want people to get, if, if, Lord, if parents are killing their children, I want those parents to be held accountable. But the system, our whole judicial system is built on this, uh, the assumption of innocence, you know, innocent until proven guilty, and ultimately it's up to the Crown and death investigators to be somewhat objective about what uh, the evidence that, they, that is placed before them. And, and Charles Smith, you know, he was incompetent, as we just discussed, he didn't have the proper training and he didn't understand what his role was. He didn't understand that he was supposed to be objective, that he wasn't supposed to take a side. And he really did see himself as an arm of the prosecution to build a case against people. And he let circumstantial evidence um, to color the forensic evidence that he found in the autopsies. Has the system at least been fixed? Has it had a slap? The coroner system is in better shape. It's not perfect, but the issues that Charles Smith, these cases uh, illustrate can still happen in the system. And that's because the system is made up of people and people are ultimately fallible. And that is why it's so important that people understand what their role is within the system and stay within the bounds. You know, if, if objectivity is, is a key part of your role, then you have to remain objective. If training is necessary, you have to make sure that you maintain your, your training and you need people up the line who are holding people to account. And there wasn't any of that in these cases. The book is Death in the Family. I've been speaking with the author John Chipman and Death in the Family is published by Doubleday Canada.